get some shares going. All right, let's see. Did I click on live yet? Maybe. Not yet. You see it on your end yet? I don't see any live. We're dead. We're not alive. There it is. Boom. It's up. All right. There we go. Let's get some sharing going here. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hey, what's up? All right. Let's do this. Let's do this. Send it out to all of our Apex peeps. Making it happen. That's it. I get to go to MDM. About uh, what, a week and a half out now. Exciting stuff, man. That is going to be uh, the event of the year. That's what they say. That's what they say. They had a. Uh, uh, Tom Brady was not able to make it after all. Yeah, he was deflated. <laughs> he was deflated, and uh, so we just were at the uh, the entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, I missed yeah. that. How was that? Yeah, we had a speaker named Travis Brady, and he was excellent. And we all unanimously decided that we should replace Tom Brady with Travis. Brady. <laughs> I think he would be just as good, to be honest, because he was he was exceptional. You know, I don't know. Like Tom Brady's cool and all that, he's successful, but like I don't know, what is you know, I don't know. He's just good at playing football. I mean, obviously he's made good life choices and stuff, but I don't know. I don't see the big draw to him. You know, you know what I mean? Like like you're famous, like you're good at football, but you know, obviously you work hard and you learn your craft. But yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't see the, the big draw to it, honestly, like, you know. Other than he's a big celebrity type thing, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I've never really been into sports all that much. Like I was. I'm not kind either. Of... Yeah, I can watch it if it's on, but I don't chase it. All right, yeah. let's get going on this thing. We got it shared out here a bunch of times. Okay. Let me get on this thing so I can see the comments. We got any comments on here? All right, I think we're good now. All right, so uh, let's see if Benny realizes I'm giving the shout out tonight to the Elite Painting. You know Benny Montalbano? I don't know if you've seen him uh, posting. Yeah, yeah, I think he's... I know the name. He's a buddy of mine, so I'm giving the shout out tonight. And then I should go full shout out. Broadway Tavern tonight. Tomorrow I'm doing a networking event over at the Broadway Tavern here in Malvern. Uh, entrepreneur meetup with my buddy David, who runs uh, 516ads.com. He was on here a couple weeks ago. Um, he basically okay. uh, took all the, the area codes from our area, but ads.com behind it. And he has a basically a business referral networking page group, and he runs business networking groups all week long. And uh, puts a lot of good people together. Uh, I've met him about 15 years ago. He kind of got me inspired into doing all this networking stuff, which really got me here to Apex, which is kind of kind of interesting how it all comes down. But anyway, welcome to the show tonight, Josh. This is uh, a pleasure to have you on. Um, we've talked a bunch in the past. You were on the show once when you were doing your um, your cross country trip. That's uh, right. You made a guest yeah, appearance. I just kind of like randomly popped my head in. And yeah, you're like, whoa, there he is. Hey. <laughs> so you popped in with that, but uh, we didn't really get to talk much about you. That was more about that uh, that journey you were doing, uh, right. raised by wolves, right? So, but uh, that's right. That book was... is the book is in progress right now. Uh, should be out sometime this fall, towards the end of the year. Awesome, awesome! I can't wait to read that. Sounds like sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> sounds like a good yeah. time, and I'm sure the book is uh, also a good time. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, and right. um, we've uh, we connected early in the game uh, back when I started my ride. Uh, my we ride at Dawn three sixty five, which is just about over now. I think um, I don't know eight days left or something like that now. And uh, you had reached out to me, and we talked about the idea of being non negotiable, and that's definitely three hundred sixty five days of non negotiable rides. So it's been a long journey, and uh, you reached out and supported me early in the game, and I appreciate you for that. Um, you, know, you know, it's really interesting because I remember that conversation very vividly, and it's it's one of those things where when you when somebody hits you, you don't forget. Mm. Like if somebody punches you in the face, you're going to remember that, you know? And, and it was one of those things because I didn't give you that idea. I just picked up the idea you had and showed it to you. So mm. You realize you just said this? Yeah. Because yeah. that's really what it was. Yeah. And that's really your, 
you're on day 358 yeah. or whatever you're at yeah. and you are you are the embodiment of being non-negotiable you get up and you do it. You live in you live in New York, where there's probably like six feet of snow yeah, in we did January it in the snow, or something. We did it in the wind. We did it in the rain. We did it. We had to in Texas. We did it on a stationary bike, whatever. We got ten miles a day, and and the message every day, and um, it's it's been fun. It's been a fun journey, you know. A little just commitment to myself. A seventy-five hard ish going wild, you know. I was talking about. It. There's a lot of days when if I don't ride in the morning because whatever's going on. Um, you get to the end of the day and your day gets busy and you go, oh shit, I didn't do my ride yet. I got to get it in. And I've done rides at 11 o'clock at night. Just, you know, well, that's when that's when the smoke clears and everything gets peaceful again. And those are actually some of the best rides because there's no one around. It's a different different beast at 11 o'clock at night when you can ride down the, you know, the double yellow line on the highway and there's no one around. So it's definitely need to take in all different experiences. But I wasn't going to bed without doing that ride. It was just... And it was funny. I had people that came to me and said... You know, why don't you just drive around in your car and get the mileage up? Like, no one will know. And I'm like, no. Like, what is the point of this? But that's how many, there's a couple people have said that to me. And I'm like, no one will know if you don't do the ride. And I'm like, I know if I didn't do the ride. I committed to myself. Yeah. If, I, if I'm going to lie to myself, you know, if I can't trust myself, who can trust me, you know? That's it's, right. uh, it was crazy. But a couple people said that to me. And like, oh, even when I was doing 75 hard, I had the same thing. Well, who's going to know if you'd skip the second workout? I'm like, I do. Like. You know, I just, I don't know. But I think that's the way a lot of the world is these days where you just cut corners and, I guess, lie, cheat, and steal, right? And, and well, what it really has to do with is uh, your own your own pride. Because if you can't believe yourself, who's going to believe you? Yeah. If you don't have faith in yourself that you're going to follow through, who else is going to have that faith? 100%, 100%. Now, I have not gotten up on a bike and rode 365 and 58 days in a row. Um, but uh, my friend uh, decided on January 1st that he was going to run a mile a day this mm -hmm. year. Yep. And he's, whatever day it is, he's on day 160 awesome. something, whatever. And and I saw that it was changing him, mm. you know? And, and so I said, you know what? I can do this for 30 days mm -hmm. and reassess, you know? Yeah. Yep. I can do this for 30 days. And so I started running every, a mile a day for 30 days. And I got to day 28. And then I'm moving my house and all this stuff. And I had zero help. I'm packing like my couch and bed and all this shit into my house. And I'm exhausted. My knees hurt. And yep. it's like 40 degrees outside. And it's and it's like two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, Fuck. And this was day 28. You know? You're like I made it this far. Am I gonna give up now? Yeah. Or am I gonna go out and yeah. run at two o'clock in the morning? All I wanted to do was just collapse. Mm -hmm. But I decided for myself, not for anybody else, I decided for myself, you know what? I'm going to finish this bastard out. That's just a like, weird thing you have. My, you know, like with yourself. My yeah. That's right. This is my opportunity to teach myself a lesson 100%. that I will never forget. And yeah. I got out there like, like a grandpa and yeah. like, yeah. and I cranked out that mile and it took me like 22 minutes yeah yeah but it was done and you went to bed and but passed out I got and it knew. done yeah and I went ahead I went to bed whole yeah 100 percent 100 percent I've I've had those moments so many times you're like shit man I just don't feel like doing this it's cold it's raining I'm tired my legs hurt I've been up all day I've been running here I'm running there this and I'm exhausted I can go to bed and fake it I can get on a bike and ride and we get on a bike and ride you know and and, and I mean, it takes a strong level of commitment to that. I mean, when when you're just done, you're tired, you're done. To get on a bike at that, you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, whatever it is, and do that ride. You're all by yourself. No one's around. Like, you know, like my latest probably, usually my latest probably like 11, I think, is the runs I did. But I've been home after midnight, you know. The ride takes about an hour. That late night ride goes a lot slower. Usually I'm just kind of just cruising, not really cranking too hard. But it is also a meditation meditation type thing, too, because... I ride down to the water, midnight on the water in the off season. There's no one around. It's desolate, and you kind of mm -hmm. it's you and yourself and the bike and the ride, and you, know, you think about a lot of stuff and make decisions and stuff like that. So, it's a it's a good mental thing too, you know, mental conditioning. But um, but you know, when you commit to something, like you know, my, my dad told me years ago, like you know, 
you want to go play baseball, whatever. And, you know, like halfway through the season, you're like, I don't want to go to practice anymore. I don't want to play anymore. And then dad's like, no, you committed to something. As soon as you're done, you don't have to do it anymore. You don't have to do it next season. But you committed to something, you follow it through to the end. Once you make a commitment, you don't let up. And that kind of stayed with me through my whole life. Like, when you commit to something, you say you're going to be there, you're going to show up, you're going to do that, you're going to be there. Like, you do it. You know, and next opportunity to renew that maybe they say next year or whatever i'm not going to do this but you know when you commit to something you commit to doing something you commit to you got to stick with it you know and it's something i think that uh, isn't taught so much in this generation the newer generations that you get tired of doing something you just give up who cares walk away like you know but um well it ties back to a conversation that we were just having a little bit ago and and it's it has to do with what what drives you? What is your, what is your engine? What, what fuels that tank? And one of the topics that we were kind of discussing in, in various different forms is the hunt. Mm. Yeah. And that hunt creates drive in all of us. Now, what are we hunting? It depends. Yeah. It depends on our motivations, our psychological or physiological needs at that time uh you know boredom it, it depends on lots of things you know it's what do we stimulus right those? i would say right it's uh you know those of us that are adhd you know we're looking for the dopamine hit you know so when we go and and and, and hyper focus on something on a goal then we get there we win it's a release of dopamine it's like whew, yeah it's a little high you know and we're constantly searching for that little that win is a high you know let's face it right so you know we're constantly on the hunt for that whether it's a, it's a real estate deal or relationship or you know just buying a car like, like you know i see a car in the paper i buy and sell everything so i see a car or something in the paper and i'm like i'm gonna go buy that i'm gonna sell it. i'm gonna make five grand on it just flipping it you know that deal when you get the car bought and then you get it back cleaned up boom i just made five grand it's like it's win 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 like you keep feeding on it now i gotta find another one and uh i really think that the basis is the i guess our or uh, it's probably inbred in us the, the thrill of the hunt, right? I mean, there's a reason they, they call, talk about the thrill of the hunt, right? It's not so much the thrill. I think it's the high of the hunt. You know, the win, the high of the win, chasing you know, the wins. You know, I was sitting in a <clears throat> sitting in a room with a guy named Zach Hawkins. Uh, just a very successful guy that's run a lot of businesses and 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 had a had a good run. And he's a he's a triathlete. Uh, He's, he's very active, has a very active lifestyle. And, and he was sitting there telling us in this, in this group, he said, I, listen, I'm the type of guy that I will bust my ass and get all of the gear and train myself and figure out how to climb this mountain. And it's really challenging. And I'm going to get to the top of the mountain and I'm going to look over and I'm going to see that next peak and be like, all right. So in the next two months, I'm going to go up that mountain and it's going to take me this much time and I can do it in this. And what's the record for that? And he's looking for that next peak. Yeah, he's looking yeah. for that next one, the next one, the next never satisfied. Yeah. You're never satisfied. And there's, and there's, there's a certain, there's a certain balance that we have to strike though, because that inability to be satisfied drives you to greatness, but it also can drive you crazy to insanity <laughs> yeah that was my message today my uh, my live message today was uh do you chase quality or quantity right so you're chasing quality of life you're chasing quantity of life right and which one there's no yeah. there's no right or wrong there's no right or wrong but at what point in the middle yeah it's a middle i mean if you if you work at 100 hours a week so you can buy 10 lambos you know you're kind of missing life you know if you if you can't sit on the i was sitting on the rocks looking at the water saying this is quality of life this is what i want I want the money to be able to do this whenever I want, you know, but, you know, I mean, like, I don't want to work 100 hours a week in order to buy crap to try and make myself happy because you're missing the whole point of life. You know, that was kind of my message today. And it's true, you know, sometimes we just, we want the next thing, we want the next thing, we want the next thing. At some point, we always got to wonder if this is really important. Is it really important to climb that next mountain? We already climbed one mountain. Do we really need to climb another mountain? Maybe we should focus on something else, you know. And it's, again, it's a battle, a constant give and take, and, and you got to ride somewhere in the middle of that. But right, if you think about it, like the more you, the thrill of the hunt, but sometimes you're hunting so hard that you're missing out on why you're hunting, <laughs> right? <laughs> Here's a little perspective on that. So uh, I'm hanging out in a room with Todd Herman, 
uh, who's the author of a book called The Alter Ego Effect. Very good book, by the way, highly recommended. Uh, and he got his start as a, uh, a sports coach for, not, not a sports coach, but kind of like a mindset coach for elite youth athletes. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was kind of talking, a lot of his experience comes from just working with thousands and thousands of young athletes and their parents and making sure that they have healthy balance with their, with their life and, and that they're in good shape here uh, emotionally. And they did this survey and they, they asked all of these kids various questions. And one of the questions that they were asking was, uh, why did you keep playing this sport so long? Or do you still wanna play? And if not, why do you still play if you don't really care to or you don't want to? And they got this, they were kind of blown away by the answers uh, because 80% of the responses were something along the lines of, I didn't really want to keep playing, but I didn't want to miss that windshield time that I got with my dad or mom mm. that was taking me to and from practice. Yeah, that's cool. And he was making the argument against quality time and for quantity time. Mm. Because it's really hard for you as a parent it's really hard for you to gauge how well how quality was this interaction yeah. but it's really easy for the kids to tell you and i just i just wanted to sit in the car with dad that's true i just wanted i didn't want to lose that time the amount of time that i was getting with my parent that was just paying attention to me that was what mattered the most for you know me, and so there's me, always you know, this yeah i have the six there's kids this so yin and yang to anything I like that same idea that I like to drive them to their activities because I get some one-on-one -on -one time with the kids, whether we're just listening to the radio or talking or whatever. There's six kids. There's so much competition for my attention and everyone's attention and, you know, and the big ones need different things than the little ones. And, but when I get to, you know, drive them to swimming lessons or whatever, you know, swim school, whatever they're doing, uh, my daughter started working. She's actually an instructor at the swim school now, which is pretty cool. I'm kind of proud. She's 14 and she's now instructing the other kids had to swim and she went through the whole program and they asked to hire her and it's kind of like it's pretty cool then at 14 that she wants to go to work and she wants to be on time and i'm like yes <laughs> it's like you know i did a good job you know and then yeah. i get to i get to drive her and pick her up whenever i can you know and i try and you know um and i find it's important to me you know that to spend that time together in the car because it's just like I said, it's just one-on-one -on -one time just you know whether you just listen to the radio together but again it's just that, that alone time together that you know, just connect a little bit um, because when you're in a house with six kids, it's just, you know, you can imagine a circus. So, like, no one gets any attention because it's just, you know, the baby usually gets the most attention because, you know, she's tiny and cute and climbs on top of me and, you know. Yeah, it makes the most noise. Yeah, it makes the most noise. <laughs> she, she doesn't stop. She's a chatterbox, so, uh, yeah. Poops the most. Yeah, she's well, she's four now, but so uh, she does, she's good like that. But, <laughs> but so, uh, that's an interesting concept so, you talk about that, though, yeah. Well, well, let me give you the other side. Okay, so this is this is fascinating. Now, this is going to have nothing to do with what I just said, but it's going to be the other side. All right. Now, there's a gentleman I was recently talking to, and I'm not going to name names, um, but uh, we had a conversation, and we hadn't talked too much, but we got on the phone, and, and he's he's living in a uh, he's living in a Latin American country right now, and uh, I could tell as soon as I got on the phone with him it was like something was off, you know? And he mentioned to me probably five or six times, he's like, man, I don't know, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of girls, I'm going out with a lot of girls. And, and it was kind of like, yeah, you know, life's good. But he kept saying it to the point to where it actually wasn't that good. You try to convince himself that life is good. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, he eventually broke down and said, dude, I don't even know, I'm not reaching, he, he said, I'm not reaching Wilt Chamberlain numbers, um, but, it's a lot of girls, dude. And to tell you the truth, it's just kind of exhausting because I just want a relationship. I just want somebody to come home to. I just want somebody that cares about me and it's stable. So he's has that quantity, you know, and my first it's reaction is kind of like, oh, yeah. you know, poor, poor dumb bastard, you know, living in a Latin American country with all these girls swarming all the time. But 
you know, he's got a point because after a while, it's like that quantity in some situations, you just want somebody that wants to be around you, that, I get that wants that. to yeah. invest that quality in you. Yeah, I get that a lot. Um, you know, except in my situation where I separated from the wife and was dating and, you know, I, I kind of, you know, in the beginning it's neat and it's exciting and it's the hunt, right? And then, um, you know, then you kind of like, kind of miss just the normal home life of being home and, you know, doing, you know, regular family stuff, dad stuff, driving in, the, you know, the station wagon to, together <laughs> type stuff, you know, it's, uh, you know, I guess the grass is always greener, right? And everything in life, right? You always think, you know, there's more to it than, uh, you know, more on the outside than uh, there really is, you know, you know, the grass is always greener, but you still got to mow it type thing, you know, and it's, uh, you know, so you're not really sure what you want, but I guess, again, in a way, it kind of makes you, I don't know, I guess trial and error, right? You get to try what what works and you kind of figure out which is the better scenario i mean myself i love the stability of just being able to just be in my house with the family and you know because it's hard to you know live two lives because once you once you marry and have kids and then go out and go on your own you always have that original life and then you got the second life that you're starting and it's now it's hard enough to juggle one life now you're juggling two lives and it's uh it's not easy it's not easy and it's you well know. it's it's sexy to be extreme hmm it's sexy to go after this edge or this edge that gives us that drive and that yeah. hunt, that hunger that's, hunt. that's yeah, really yeah. getting us yeah. going. But how many people have we talked to or learned from or listened to or books that we've read that said all of the wins happen from the boring shit in the middle. Yeah. You know, it's not like, Oh, I got to go over here and do this crazy shit. Well, I got to go over here and do this crazy shit. No, I got to get up every day and do the boring shit. Yeah. And that's what's going to stack the wins. Yeah. I mean, how many times have you heard some variation of that message? Yeah. And I think it's also, we hit a certain point, whether it's our business or relationship or whatever, where we won and now we let off the gas, right? And we stop trying, right? And I talk about this, uh, this is, I've said this a couple of times in my live messages. So everyone's right. The minute someone gets divorced, male or female, Right away, they go to the gym, they get skinny, right? They get their hair done, they get their nails done, they get whatever going, right? Then they meet someone and they're buying them flowers and they're texting them good morning and, you know, hello, older the days and being cute and all this other stuff that goes on while you're dating. And if you would have just did that with your spouse, you wouldn't be out <laughs> dating now. If you would have dated your spouse, so I talk about it all the time. It says, never stop dating your spouse. You know, again, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I got lazy, I got fat, I was 305 pounds. I wouldn't want to be with me if I was her, you know, like, I get it. Um, I was miserable. I was cranky. Like, you know, I didn't want to do nothing. You know, six kids running around trying to make a living. You know, like, I wasn't fun to be around. I get it. So, but if you think, and then right away we split up and I lose a bunch of weight and, you know, start paying attention and being fun and, you know, better attitude and join Apex, fix my mindset. And it's like, if you would have just stuck with that through the program and I tell all the married guys in our network or deeper relationship like never stop dating that spouse like you know never never let off the gas and that also goes for business how many people start a business you see like a restaurant's big all the time new restaurant in town right the owner's there every night it's great you know food's great the people service is great this and that and then the owner's there you know four nights a week three nights a week two nights a week the owner shows up maybe once a week you watch the restaurant service go down food go down everything goes down and the restaurant closes in a couple of years or gets bored or has to get revamped because why the owner let off the gas. It's, I mean, you see it so much in the restaurant world. You know, this restaurant's a new restaurant. The owner's there every night. It's his baby. He starts making a bunch of money, lets off the gas, and the thing crashes and burns. And I think it's a lot of businesses are like that. You know, we you start winning, you start making money, and then you stop trying. And you stop, you know, stop the good morning text to the to your workforce, <laughs> you know, whatnot. You know, you stop uh, following up with the customers the way you should. You stop, you know, doing all the stuff that you're supposed to do because, you, you know, listen, either... Either we're getting lazy or we're on to the next hunt. And it's probably a little bit of both, you know, like, right? Where you get complacent, you get, you know, same thing with a diet, right? I lost a bunch of weight. I freaking lost, I don't know, like 80 pounds. And I gained probably 25, 30 back at this point. Why? Because I took my foot off the gas. I'm still riding my bike, but you know what? I'm not eating grilled chicken every day. I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, it's just, you take your foot off the gas and then, you know, then it's a pound a week for the last couple of weeks. And next, you know, it's. 25 pounds, and you're like, shit, when did that happen? And, you yeah, know, it's, 
but he get complacent. Like, you know, I busted my ass, busted my ass, you know, ate freaking grilled chicken every day and night and got myself to uh, worked out, you know, 75 hard twice a day. And, you know, and then that's the hard thing with 75 hard, right? You put that effort in. I don't know, I don't know if you've done it or not, but 75 hard, right? You kill yourself for 75 days. And it's a good mental mind mind reset. So it's a good mental. You lose, I lost 34 pounds on 75 hard. And it was, it was great for that. Um, but then you get off and I took my foot off the gas. And like right away, you're like, and I noticed... I was starting to fall back the really hunt quick. Was over. Yeah, you know, I was like, the hunt was over. I won the battle. Seventy-five days. I did it. I won. Lost weight. Feel great. This and that. Let's go out and get something to eat. You know. And then, like twenty so days in, I had to jump on phase one because I saw myself crashing and burning like quick. And I was like, oh, boop, another win, another challenge. Thirty days, and let me do another thirty days. And then that kind of got me back in track a little bit. And then slowly I started letting off the gas, and I went for my uh, phase two and did that. And I, now I need it again. I need to get back on it. But like you know, now I'm like I know how hard it is because I've done it. And now I'm like, it's a big commitment right now. <laughs> well, and you know, I think you really hit on something. One of the reasons that that's so popular and successful is because it creates that hunt that forces the drive factor to come yeah. out. Yep. Because it's hard to do the right thing all the time. It's hard, man. Like our bodies, our brains, our ancestry is all built against it 100%. and so it's hard to just keep doing that same thing always it's hard to get up and eat grilled chicken every day and vegetables yeah. like who wants to do that nobody yeah. wants to do that yeah like bacon is fucking awesome dude <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and and so sometimes if if you catch yourself like always falling off i think first you know, coming back to the four agreements, that last that last agreement is the one that makes all the rest of them valid by always do your best. Mm. You know, if you mess something up, skip tomorrow and start again. We write it down. You're all right. <laughs> we write it down. Whatever happened yesterday, tomorrow's another day. That's right. We write it mm. down, man. Yeah. That's the whole the whole basically mission behind that is uh, the whole message of we write it down is no matter what happens today. Good, bad, and ugly, pretty. We get up tomorrow, and we start over again, and we ride again. And, uh, you know, I think 75 hard, I think, um, you know, if you use the app, and you check boxes, I think that's part of the, the thing that keeps you going, is you're winning every day. Every time you hit a check, win, check, win. Close it out. Every little thing checked off, win, boom. I won for the day. I hunted for the day. I killed my prey. Boom, let's start again tomorrow. And you do it for 75 days. You get 75 wins in a row one big win at the end but then the minute that you don't have anything to win with you don't have a checkbox anymore you it's easy to not do the workout it's easy to not eat right it's easy because you don't have that accountability accountability is huge i think for just for humans in general i mean uh, whether it's health or whether it's business you know accountability partners are when you know someone's checking on your weight in the morning you know someone's checking to see if you did your task you know you're gonna do it because you know someone no one wants to fail but when no one's checking, you're like, yeah, no one's checking. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, no one's checking. I'll, I'll work on it next week. You know, it, it's it's a game we play with ourselves, right? But I think it's just super important. Right? So between the, the thrill of the hunt and the winning and an accountability of someone looking over your shoulder saying, hey, did you do that? All right, yeah, I did it. You know, I got to do it, you know. Um, it's the strangest thing. Like, if you just if you just have somebody asking you if you yeah. did the thing, it increases your chance of actually doing the thing by like 95%. Yep. Now, I, I, that may be a made up statistic, but I think it's reasonable. No, I think it's pretty reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it's just like, they're not doing anything. They're not being pissed at you. They're not like, no, no, Brian, no. did you do your ride today? But if no. you just have somebody saying, Hey, you told me you were going to do this thing. Did you do the thing? Yeah. Just that so, increases the chances that you'll do it. My ex started his gym program, and she has to send a picture of the scale every morning, like eight o'clock in the morning. Picture of the scale to the, to the you know coach trainer or whatever it is, and like literally start badgering her like, like where's this picture? Where's the picture? Where's the picture? And then she has to take a picture of herself at the gym and send it to the trainer, which is just accountability. Like you can't fake a picture of you at the gym, uh, <laughs> you know. You can't fake the scale in the morning. You know, but you know, when you get sending someone a picture of that scale in the morning, you're probably not going to have that cheesecake before bed, you know, <laughs> right? You know, it's, right. it's a game, right? But it's, it's reality, you know, um, I don't know, mind yeah. over matter or, you know, 
I think our minds are weak. Our, our willpower is weak. No matter, I don't care who you are. Without a without a checkbox, without a, a you know an accountability partner, we all, you know, I think we all tend to, you know, lay off and not go as hard as we can. You, you have a whole different mindset when someone's looking over your shoulder. You know, I've always wondered why, uh, like, I get this catharsis when I just like check some like checklists. I'm like, yeah. yay, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, I get this catharsis, man. It's like done yeah. you know and i've always like everything that i do in my life i try to boil it down to like many checklists mm. and i've never really thought about why but but i think you just helped me unpack that to understand better those are many wins i am mm. hunting, hunting for that winning. satisfaction hunting, of hunting kill yep hunting kill hunting and, kill and that's my kill kill that yep. task you're dead yep. motherfucker yeah yep. that's it no, I think that's 100%. what it's about. I know myself, if I have a, my calendar, so I'm trying to get more into using my phone calendar as much as possible. I'm, I've always been, you know, shoot from the hip and try and memorize it. And as the more busy you get, the older you get when your mind's shot. So now I put in a phone and I open my phone and, and I got something like every half hour, every hour. And I'm hitting my things. Okay, this meeting's done. That meeting's done. This meeting's done. Call this person. Do this. Do that. I go through the day and I'm like, Psh. like you feel like you won. And I'll have a day with like not much scheduled. And I feel like I didn't do anything all day. Like it was a loss of a day. Like, you know, I had two things on my calendar today to do. Like, I don't know. I feel like it was a waste of a day. Like rather, I'd almost like, like when I got a filled up day, it's like, all right, every, every hour on the hour, I'm hitting another task, hitting another task, another meeting, another, this, another phone call, another, you know, send this, email that, whatever, you know? Um, I think it said it's good. It's almost like, uh, I don't know, whatever, the feeding the adrenaline or whatever of the winds. On a day when you only have two things to win and you, you can easily win two things in a day, it's like, eh, this wasn't really a win of a day. It was like a waste of a day, you know? But, uh, yeah, it's right. funny. Yeah, it's really, as it comes back to, I think, our na natural instincts to hunt, right? right. Got to get that hunt. Natural the hunt, hunt creates the drive, you know? And and just that one sentence, that the hunt creates the drive, would probably define and describe every good and bad thing that we have done in the last 10 years you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you really think about it the hunt creates the drive so what are you hunting and why are you driving yourself towards that hunt yeah you know and if you can answer those questions you have a chance of making better decisions with your life you know 100%. and we're just we're just a couple of armchair philosophers here mashing this out as we go yeah. but i think there's something to that right oh i 100 percent. 100 percent. it's it's primal instincts to to hunt and kill and feed our families, right? So whether it's a real estate, so we're both in real estate, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. You do um, um, rental properties and I've done a bunch in the past. I Back in, I don't know, mid 2000s, I bought a whole bunch of rental properties, North Carolina, I had trailer parks, I had all kinds of good stuff. And then when the economy tanked, um, I got my ass handed to me because I was over leveraged and tons of mortgages and no one was paying the rent. and. Uh, I was in a town where they, uh, a city where they basically did a rental inspection and they'd come in and make me spend 1500 two grand on an apartment to rent an apartment for $500 a month and then they'd get in three months and I'd have to evict them. And it was like the process was just going over and so I, I couldn't rent them until I spent 1500 bucks on them because they'd come in and, oh, fix this molding, fix this handle. And they garbage apartments. They were, you know, real blue collar, just, you know, housing. And, you know, I tried to take care of my stuff, but... They nitpick every little thing. And so you're spending 1000 1500 bucks for a $500 a month apartment. So the first three months are a loss. And then next thing you know, I'm evicted. And the process got so old, I was just like, so when the economy came back, I just started unloading them. As soon as I can get out of them, basically what I had into them and stuff, I was like, let me stop the bleeding. I don't want to do this anymore. And now, penny wise, dollar foolish, everything I owned is worth double what it was. And if I could have just stuck it out a couple more years, I'd probably, you know, be sitting here retired right now. But, you know. It only cost a million dollars to get a million dollar education. And honestly, I was done. I was broke. I was, I was broken. Like, you know, literally, you know, when it's like, you know, pay the mortgage on your personal house, pay the mortgage on a rental house, you know, like put food on the table or pay the bank. Like, you know, it's, you know, it was a lot of, you know, my credit got trashed. I short sale the property. You know, it was just like, I was, I went some so high, so many wins. Every time I'd buy a property with cash flow. I went ten thousand a month clear, and I, at one point I was like, I'm making ten grand a month sitting here in my chair. This is freaking awesome. So I was just, you know, figured let me just keep buying more and buying more and buying more, and leverage and buy, leverage and buy, leverage and buy. I was flipping houses, taking the money I made from the house, putting it down on the next house, 
you know, I'd buy stuff that need work. I had a contractor guy in North Carolina was doing work for me, so I was buying stuff that needed work. He was going in, cleaning them up, getting them rented. He became my property manager until his girlfriend, wife, whatever she was, had a pill popping problem and was stealing the rent. Which So people were coming in with money orders to pay the rent. She said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll fill it out for you. And she'd put her name on it and cash it. And then she'd put the apartment down as vacant. So I had vacancies that I didn't even realize. I mean, they weren't actually vacant. Um, we figured it out. And actually, I basically threatened to put her in jail. And she, they paid a bunch of it back. But over a couple of years, I put it on a payment program. But that's the stuff that you deal with as a remote investor, which is tough. I had that also. I got investment properties upstate New York. And same thing. Uh, the lady was great. Um, took over my properties, raised all the rents, um, basically raised her rents more than a fee. I was managing myself and it was making me crazy because they were about three and a half hours north of me. So every time I had a situation, I had to try get in the car and drive three and a half hours up to the property. And then I had long term tenants, so it wasn't bad. When a tenant moved out, now I'm trying to rent the thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not from the area. And you're trying to screen tenants. I had some gang member apply for the for the thing. Luckily, I caught it, and it was like, yeah, no, well, this ain't gonna work. Um, it was crazy. So I hired her, and she put her fee ten percent or whatever she was charging, and raised the rents more than ten percent. I was like, yes, like you know, now I have to deal with it. I'm making more money. Everything was great for about a year, and then she started popping pills. And next thing you know, <laughs> oh, you know, where's the rent? Oh, you know, I had a bunch of repairs this month. Don't worry, I'm gonna fix the repairs. I'll send you the difference. Next month goes by. Uh, what's going on? Oh no. We had more repairs to do this and that. Don't worry, I'll get you the bill, this and that. And we were friendly. We got to the point, you know, it's a problem. We're getting friendly with them. I trusted her. All right, whatever. You know, get me the bills. You know, it's a side deal for me. It's not going to rely on the income. And I feel like the third month, I'm like, all right, what the hell is going on? One wind up, one of the tenants reaches out. She works in the drugstore in town. And she goes, you know, she's a pill popper, right? And I go, like, what do you mean? She goes, yeah, yeah. She's like, I load her prescriptions up for pills all the time. She gets phony prescriptions and comes into this, the drugstore and, so look further into it. I was paying for the garbage pickup on her house because he had to pay for garbage pickup at the apartment. So I was also I'm on the bill was also her house on I was paying for her garbage. I don't know how much shit costs up there. It's you know yeah, yeah. it's a whole different world. Everything's expensive in New York City. So when you go upstate, I expect it to be expensive. You know, right. Plus I was paying for two. So uh, all kinds of different stuff. Repairs that I got charged for that weren't done. I mean, all you know that's how she was hiding the money. You know, and it sucks. Well, can... Yeah. You know, I can tell you, I, I ran a podcast uh, for four years called How to Lose Money. And <laughs> we interviewed investors and entrepreneurs, and, and they shared major failure stories that they learned uh, and the lessons that they learned from it. And uh, I can tell you the, the number one type of guest that we had on was a multifamily investor. <laughs> and the number one thing that happened that caused them to be on our show was poor selection of property management yeah. like by far a uh, an unscrupulous property manager is is the most popular way for you to lose money as a multifamily investor and i'm and i'm giving you empirical data yeah. <laughs> from 238 episodes yeah i could tell uh, you of, of asking the same question and uh one guy had to go through five different property managers I did, uh, all Carolina five of them four. ripped him off yeah all yeah. five of them yeah and it is very tough to find the right person and even when you do find the right person like you did it's very first it's very tough for them to stay the right person and yeah. so it's one of those things where if you are going to have a portfolio full of assets and you're going to hand the management of that portfolio over to somebody else you really have to be vigilant about managing the manager hmm. and you have to stay on top of that stuff and because usually those red flags will pop up early like yeah. what they did yeah. and you're like ah oh, you know whatever and then they just if you don't fix it right then it's just gonna get worse it's right. back to the same, so, taking your foot off the gas, you know, right? You get, you take these you properties the down, you throw them under the management. Okay, set it and forget it. Walk away, I don't have to touch this anymore. You know, mine were in North There's Carolina. No I was going down to visit in twice a year, then it was once a year, then it was once every two years. They knew I wasn't coming down checking anything anymore. Like, you know, it's like, because life got busy. I was having kids like every 18 months, and uh, who's got time to fly down to North Carolina and check your property? It was a side gig for me, and you know, the less I paid attention, the more they took advantage. The less I paid attention, the more they took advantage. And same with Upstate. And uh... the thing that I can say just just from being around a long time is, and this is this is going to like 
poop in somebody's Kool-Aid, you know, but here's the thing that you really have to think about. There is no truly passive income. Mm. There is no truly passive income. Yeah. And anybody that tells you that is trying to sell you something that doesn't yeah. exist. Uh, I'm surrounded by a ton of real estate investors who have passive income. Uh, and it's not passive at all. Uh, you can work a little bit and make a lot, but as far as here's some money, now cut me a check later, that really doesn't exist. Even in the situations where uh, you're in a syndication or a private placement where somebody else is doing all the work and you're just saying, here's $100,000, make it grow. It's still your responsibility to carefully vet the operators and make sure that those operators are taking good care of your money. And that's not passive. Yeah. You got to check in with them. You got to have a relationship with them. You got to make sure that they don't start popping pills. Yeah. And, and then you got to make sure that they bring your property all the way through to the finish line so that you can get paid on the back end. Yeah. And that's not passive. No. It's mostly passive. Mostly passive, but yeah, it's not, but it's not full hands If you off, really yeah. want to win, man, you got to understand and accept the fact that anything that you do is going to carry some sort of risk and the only person that's responsible for you winning or losing is you mm -hmm. 100% I think what you know from my perspective now with the you know cost of a million dollars get a million dollar education you got to visit your properties you got to get it on rotation and I think you should visit your properties without telling your property manager like surprise I'm here meet me at the house I want to see you know I started doing that more uh, upstate. I do that. I, I got a great property manager upstate New York. I got a couple up there now. Uh, only a couple I have left. But I'm up there a lot. And I'm literally like, all right, I'm in front of the house right now. Can you tell them I want the uh, barbecue off the front lawn? And I want this cleaned up. And I want, you know, this tree's overhanging the house. I want that tree trimmed. And, you know, they know I'm watching. I mean, I trust the her 100% because uh, she's been you know, really good. And I finally, you know, makes me want to buy more properties because when property manages everything, let's face it. When you're doing investment properties, it is it is everything. If you got a good property manager, build in that area. And that's the other thing I think. Once you got a good property manager in the area, you get comfortable with the area. You start to know what the type of clientele that's renting there. You start to know the the building regulations, the city regulations. And when I bought North down in North Carolina, they didn't do property inspections. And then after I owned a whole bunch of them, they decided, oh, before you rent, before you get the lights turned on, we need a property inspection from the city housing authority. And they would just come in and be like, yeah, that molding's broken and uh, that knob's missing on the cabinet and that linoleum's got a crack in it. And, you know, $1,500 later, okay, now I got this $500 a month apartment rented, rented for three months, and then they stopped paying the rent, and now I'm evicted them. And then, oh, you want to get it rented again? Oh, let me send the inspector. Oh, you know, there's $1,500 of new stuff we found on this property. And it's like, it's not a luxury apartment. It's a $500 a month apartment. Like, you know, it's housing. You know, like, it's not brand new. Like, you know, but they would scrutinize and it was really it was getting beat up and like i said i was talking before i dumped a bunch of my properties when the economy started getting better and probably shouldn't have you know looking back because you know everything i everything i was selling investors were buying up and now they doubled their money but i just wanted to stop yeah. the bleeding and um but uh, well it's hard it's hard to time the market it's it's really not even possible to do we we think we can um but the reason that people buy high and sell low is because well it's kind of just follows human nature really yeah <laughs> you know we don't want to put ourselves in position of of a uh, high possibility of loss and so we stay back and we wait we're like okay uh it doesn't look like anybody else is falling off the cliff anymore i think it's okay for me to get close but by then like too late, yeah. people have already figured out the game and you're screwed <laughs> and I say everything goes up over time. If you hold it long enough, I mean, uh, the properties I have upstate New York, I mean, they probably doubled in value since I've owned them. You know, one is, I don't know, one's like five years. The other one's probably, shit, I don't know, 10 years now. Um, and the rent comes in every month and they're long-term tenants. And, um, you know, I wish I would have bought more because now I will go to buy more now and they're at the level of, minor worth which is double what i paid for i'm like i'm not paying that for that i paid half for mine but that was 10 years ago you know <laughs> yeah, right. and now it's like now do i buy more like are they gonna go double again like you know do i reach and you know it's, it's always the game we got going right trying to read the market you know 
But um, yeah. I think, you know, basically you got a cash flow formula on investment properties. And no matter what the price is, do the rents make sense? You know, it could be a, a $200,000 unit or a million dollar unit. If the rents are $200 a month or 20000 a month, you know, it's just in the numbers game. You know, actually you buy investments on numbers and you take your personal feelings out of it, I think is really the game. You know, the numbers work, the numbers work. There's, there's, there's two things that I've found that make market conditions irrelevant. And uh, that's a juicy headline, man. I want to write an article yeah, with that headline. But yeah. there, are, there really are, there are two things that you can put in place that are going to make the market conditions irrelevant. It does not matter what the market does as long as you have these two things in place. The first one is you need to be hyper conservative with your underwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to, uh, unless you really know what you're doing, you want to avoid any form of speculation. Mm -hmm. you, you want to avoid jumping into a speculation territory because that's when you're significantly increasing your chances of loss. You want to be conservative. And if you can't find deals that pencil out with your conservative underwriting, walk away because those deals either exist or you need to wait. Yeah. And then the second thing that is going to make market conditions irrelevant is to surround yourself with people who know what the fuck they're doing. Mm. Don't take advice from some dude that you heard on a podcast. Yep. Don't read a book or go to a seminar and think, oh, okay, well, that's how I do it. Surround yourself with people who really know what's up. People who are already doing this yeah. and do what they do. Yeah. So conservative underwriting and surround yourself with a team of seasoned veterans and the market conditions become irrelevant really fast. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that hundred percent. The, uh, when you're looking at the numbers, so I, I used to have a rough rule to just look and evaluate properties hundred times the monthly rent. So if it rented for two grand a month, you'd pay 200,000 for it. Right, and that's too much. I got to the point where it was fifty times. If I rented for you know uh, two thousand or whatever, we we'd buy it for a hundred thousand. And now that's when you start making cash flow. Now you know and again, there's different taxes and repairs, and you know who's paying the utilities and stuff like that. But at that point, it's just a quick. As I'm looking through the houses, what's the rent roll? How much you're asking? Okay, this one's worth looking at. You know, as a way to just quick boil it down. Uh, in the beginning, I was paying too much for them. You know, I thought you know if it rented for Eleven hundred dollars a month, and I paid one hundred and ten for it. Oh, it's a good deal. Well, those you're lucky if those break even. Lucky, you know. And then there's a repair, this and that. If I could pay, you know, I have one I paid sixty thousand for. I rented for twelve fifty. Now, you know, double cash flows every month. Not a huge win, but a bunch of little wins together, little exposure. Um, and that house is probably worth about one eighty now in about eight years. So that was a win. So I, I gained the equity in the house, plus I'm getting my twelve fifty a month for the last eight years. And I uh, actually bought a cash off a flip. You know, I flipped the house and took the profit and bought a cash. So it's just like money every month. Now, again, you say about oh, 1200 bucks, take the management off of, you know, I walk away with, you know, 1000 a month, 1000 a month for doing, you know, I wouldn't say nothing, but, you know, passive income. Again, you stack a bunch of them up together and it's a good living, you know. And that was kind of the mess, the mission I was on was to have a whole bunch of little wins. But then I also find that on a thousand a month apartment and the, the boiler goes and it costs you a couple of grand, it takes a half a year to get caught up again, you know, to get the back to break even point, you know. So now if it was a $2,000 a month apartment and the boiler goes, it's the same boiler basically. Like, you know what I mean? Like, is it better to get into the higher end units than the cheap units? And then also the clientele in the higher end units generally treats the place better than clientele in a cheaper unit you know I, and, and, and all of that can be underwritten right so like yeah. we could tell that you know the the cheaper properties are going to have a different type of person that's maybe going to treat the property different and we can account for all of that with our underwriting that's where yeah. being super conservative about your underwriting you know that regardless of the the price of the property this property is going to come up with x expense and this property is going to come up with y expense if we can predict that with a reasonable amount of certainty, that's going to allow us to make a better purchasing decision, uh, which will keep us out of bad deals hmm. and 
in the good deals. And then what's the best way to know that? Surround yourself with all people that have been in all those situations yeah. to say, well, hang on, dude. You need to check, make sure that the boiler is not going to go. Yeah. That's where that's where that experienced season veteran is going to help you feed back into that conservative yeah, yeah. underwriting, keep you out of trouble. Yeah, what's your big exposures on this? How's the roof? How's the boiler? How's all the big, big dollar items? That's I had a couple that were like three hundred dollars. I still have. I have one that's a three unit, and it's like three three hundred, three fifty a unit. Um, makes about a thousand a month. I own it outright. You know, low taxes on it, but repairs on a three hundred dollar unit. You know, I got to spend a couple grand to fix something. It's almost a year's worth of rent. You know, it's like so like. On paper, without well, without repairs, on, it's great. Is, where are you renting something for three hundred dollars a month, and is it like is it like a unfinished basement or what? Like, so this is a exist? small one bedroom house and two uh, trailers on a property in North Carolina. Oh I paid, my god! I paid man. sixty grand. No, sixty grand. I think I paid for it a bunch of years ago. It's probably still worth sixty grand if that. And it brings in eleven hundred a month. That's the rent roll. So you look at it and say, you know, based on numbers, my formula, right? All right, so it brings in 1100 paid 64 it's roughly 50% of the rent roll. And when nothing breaks, it makes money every month. But then when yeah, I got to repair, yeah. um, you know, repair can wipe me out for half the year, you know. Um, that's, one of the, that's one of the craziest things. Like, sometimes we tend to, uh, we tend to just live in the world that we're in. Uh, I had somebody tell me this way, you know, when you're, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, you know, I live in Austin, Texas. You, you live in New York City. And $300 a month, like, that's probably like a, a storage locker at the at the Amazon kiosk in yeah, Austin. Basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't even imagine anything costing, or even 1100 bucks a month, you know? Yeah. Like, I can't think of one single place around here that's eleven hundred bucks a month. Even like a one bedroom apartment. Yeah, be lucky if you could find like a basement studio apartment illegal for like eleven hundred here. You know. Yeah, it's like crashing on somebody's couch is eleven hundred. Yeah. yeah. No, so it's like a different world. So like buying real estate around this area to me doesn't make any sense. The taxes are so high. I mean, I had a two family here locally, and basically the rent from one unit paid the taxes on it, and the rent from the other unit paid the mortgage on it, and again. Anytime something broke, I was out of pocket on it. Mm. And yeah, you get some write offs and stuff out of it. But mm. at the end of the day, you get some appreciation. You know, property values go up here pretty good. But at the end of the day, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Every year I'm doing the math. And I'm like, this thing cost me money again. This thing cost me money again. Next year's going to be better. All right, I did the boiler this year. All right, next year's the hot water heater. Next year, oh, there's a vacancy. And it's like every year, you're like, when am I going to freaking win with this property? And finally, you're like, enough. Let me just sell it. You know, and I did that with a couple of them. And it's definitely, I'm sure you've been there with these, but I think, I think I'm playing with small potatoes where I think it was, you get into more of uh, an apartment building type thing where there's multiple units that even if a couple go, there's enough rent roll to cover the cost of repairs, enough rent roll to cover the cost of vacancies. When it's a small unit and it goes vacant, it's done. When you got a 20 units and it go two go vacant, so what? You know, it's just the gravy. It's not, it's not the bread and butter, you know? Um, I think yeah. that's I think that's the difference that I've I've taught myself the bigger units. I had a five family that uh, I paid one hundred and fifty for and I got about twenty five hundred dollars a month out of it. But the problem was it was an older unit and central air units were going, heating systems going, you know. So it was like okay, twenty five hundred dollars a month and three months just paid for the heating system and AC in that unit. Okay, back on track. Oh, next one's down. Oh, now it needs a roof. Now, you know, it's like. You know, all right, like, when's the bleeding going to stop, you know? So, I mean, I, at, at points I made good. I learned a lot. You know, there's a lot of write-offs depreciation and stuff, that which helped because I was flipping houses and I was using the depreciation of the rentals to help offset the income of the flips. So I was paying tons of tax on the income from the flip money. So it did kind of work out in that favor, but definitely learned a lot through the years. But uh, the concept, I love it. I mean, I love the passive income of rentals, but definitely buying them right is, uh, and managing them right is really the best. You make your money on the purchase, and you make your money on the management. Without that, you pay too much and have a shitty manager, man, you're in for a long ride. Yeah. Bill Poppins a bitch, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe I got hit twice on that. That was definitely uh, two different ends of the world. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. And then the flips, too. I was doing a lot of flips, but uh, same thing. You make your money on the flip on the purchase. 
couple of the flips I did were like a home run. Like I could sell this house tomorrow without even doing anything and make money on it. And then mm-hmm. there's other ones I'm like, you know what? I think I can make money on it. And I caught myself. Whenever I say I think I can make money on this, you know, I'm doing the math. Eh, I can make a quick 30 grand. That quick 30 grand turned into seven on one, you know, turned into 15 on another, you know, for like big outlay, big risk versus reward, you know. Um, when the economy tanked, that one in 2008, I guess it was. Should have made about 100 on the house, and uh, we wound up making 15, and I did all the work myself, me and a buddy of mine, electric plumbing, like 10 hour days, seven days a week, like, you know, and then basically didn't make any money. <laughs> it's like, all right, learn a lesson there. Now I hire contractors to do flips for me and get it done in six weeks before the market corrects, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah, man. Good yeah, stuff. Like the- it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy world out there, uh, but you know the the best advice and really outside of real estate, be conservative with your estimates. Surround yourself by experts, and you're always going to be in good shape. Right, don't force deals. I've learned that. Don't if the deal's not there. Don't force it. That's right. right? Well, a lot of times we we want the deal. It sounds good and we want it, but we're looking at the numbers. Go. Eh, I think I can make this work. If you ever say I think in your numbers, walk away. <laughs> that's a good, good, that's a good measuring stick. right if you think about it though right i'm sure you have deals in the past when you say you know i think this one will make money and it's definitely your underproducer if if at all you know that one minute you got moment of doubt that this isn't a sure thing walk away because uh that's a, definitely every time every time i've ever had a i think i can make this work it's been uh you know it's been a loser or not not the winner that i thought it was going to be but yeah uh, all right good stuff so um where can we find you at? Yeah, you know, I have a podcast called The Do Zone. And uh, you can find that on Apple or Spotify. You can also go to thedozone.com and learn more about it there. Uh, but I would just love it if you would come over there and check out it. Uh, there's, a, there's a Brian Lewis Jr. episode, I believe. Yes. That's right. We run it and on. We had a we had a good time on there. We fun. ride at dawn. That was fun. So go check out his episode, and uh, we're we're putting out two a week, one solo, of just kind of me with cool ass shit that I've heard and want to comment on, and then another one uh, where we do interviews. And in fact, I am going to do a solo episode soon called "The Hunt Creates the Drive." There that, you go. That is my inspiration that I got from this episode. Like Thank you very like much it. for that one, Brian. I like it. I like it. And then uh, yeah. you also do a real estate coaching program, right? Um, That's right. So uh, I work with a gentleman named Michael Blunk, B-L-A-N-K. And uh, he is one of the foremost authorities in the multifamily investing space. And so if you are interested in purchasing, purchasing large uh, apartment complexes through syndication, which is basically raising the capital from other people and not bringing your own capital to the table so that you can scale faster, uh, then you're welcome to reach out to me directly or you can go to themichaelblunk.com and learn more about what we're doing there. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. Yeah, Anything else in the works we should know about or uh, we covered it all? all? All kinds of things in the works, but, you know, it's just, it's always a pleasure to sit down and, and uh, you know, bounce around ideas with you and yeah, yeah, I love uh, it. And, and just kind of see see what develops. You know, we, we planted some seeds and, and they sprouted into these huge flowers and I, I just love it. I love the conversation. Yes, good stuff. Very good, very good. Love it. And uh, we'll see you at uh, MDM. I know you said you got to have a prior commitment, so you'll be coming in late, but uh, that's, uh, that's good. Better late than never. We'll definitely connect on a Saturday night there. That's and, right. And uh, I appreciate you, brother. Um, again, check out the Do Zone podcast. Uh, look for the episode. Uh, all the episodes are great, but there's one that's really ex- exceptional with the one with me on it. And uh, we had some fun. And uh, yeah, that's it. So keep doing. Keep uh, winning. And, uh, that's it. Keep hunting. All right, right. Thank you for coming on, Josh. It was a pleasure. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Everyone, um, if you uh, want to see this episode, if you missed it, it'll be on the wall. Uh, all the past episodes are on YouTube at Brian Lewis Realtor on YouTube. You can go check out all the past episodes and listen to them, get some wisdom. If you want to be on the show, uh, we're booking out guests. A couple people have asked me, just nail me down. Let's get you scheduled, and we'll see you on the show soon. Right, everyone, appreciate you all. Have a great night, and uh, we'll do this again soon. All right, good night.